I'm Nina, and I'm the founder of the What We Wore Archive. I'm just going to pass this around. So. Um, so What We Wore is a people's history of British youth style, a photographic documentary of street culture and subculture through the lens of the people living it. Um, there's a book being passed around, um, which is the book that I published last year. Um, people often ask me, um, the main, um, how did you come up with the idea for what we wore? So I'm going to take you right back. Um, this is an image of um, Liam Gallagher and um, Damon Albarn from Blur. And um, this is, I think this is like, we used to, when I was a teenager, we used to go to these celebrity football matches. And I think it, I always show, I like to show this image because I think it, it takes you back to a time when style felt very tribal in the UK. Um, for me as a teenager, um, um, style and music and style went hand in hand. This is um, from the first gig I went to when I was 13. I remember spending about two weeks getting ready and working out what I was going to wear. It was a real way for me and my friends to bond and to form a kind of group and a sense of identity, and it was the first way for us to express ourselves. This was very much in contrast to school, the uniformity of school, and the kind of the regime that we felt. So I think style was really an, a kind of real form of, of self-expression for me. And this is me when I was 16. I remember my friend had cut my hair, which is why it's got the big sort of thing in the side. I dyed it with super drug hair dye. And I went to a photo booth, which was kind of like the 20th century equivalent of the selfie. So it was this kind of like, it was a big deal for me. And I think this kind of, I think our drive to collect particular things is sometimes something quite personal and can be marked by an early experience, which is lodged inside our brains. Collecting really takes dedication. It has to mean something. So this is kind of just to give you a background of why I was driven to collect these images. So fast forward to the end of last year, and the What We Wore book was published by Prestel. So this is a kind of compilation of the best images submitted so far from the digital archive. So I had the kind of the actual idea for What We Wore um, about six years ago. And I began collecting images for the project, um, just looking at images through Flickr. So as a photographer, I'm really, I take a lot of images of young people. I've worked a lot with young people. So I'm really, really kind of this idea Subcultural photographers, photographers who document youth culture really, really interests me. I think at the time, back in 2009, I was, upload, I was uploading my own images to Flickr. And I was kind of also looking really actively at other people's pictures. And um, I just noticed a lot of people were uploading pictures of their youth um, and of their kind of their style. And there was a real energy in these people's own pictures that you didn't necessarily see in photographers who were outsider photographers who might be documenting scenes from the outside. So really, it was just a hobby for me. I started off just kind of like um, set, uh, asking people to add their images to the group. And what was really, really nice about these images is that there were captions with these images that, w that went to tell the story behind the pictures. So really, this was just a kind of hobby that I was doing aside of all my other work. Later in 2011, um, I kind of found a home for the idea. Um, I used to co-run a website called I Saw You Standing, which again was about some of the issues, sort of youth identity. And this is the first, um, it was a blog site that we ran, and this was the first post, um, the first What We Wore post. This is an image from Flickr, and it's actually an American image um, from a girl, it was called the Death Rock Days. So what I did is I, uh, I asked this girl a few questions, I got permission to use her image and um, I published this on the site with an extract. And it was really, really popular and really, really widely shared. So it was through this that I kind of began, um, this was kind of like a weekly format. And I'd start, at this point I started telling friends and family and asking everyone I knew, do you have any pictures of your teenage style? Can you send them to me? Can you scan them? Can you take a picture on your phone? So really kind of like getting the public involved in the project. And I also thought, I mean, my background is also in kind of self-publishing and making books. And I thought the book format would be a really great format for this. Um, fast forward to 2012, and I um, pitched the idea to Prestel. And um, they um, were keen for the book to come out, and they gave me a timeline. So suddenly the pressure was on to collect images. So I built a standalone site um, for the project. I wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to submit. 
Um, believe it or not, people you know, finding images of their teenagers not on the top list of their priorities. So I had to make it really, really simple. So I built a Tumblr website, and people could literally, they could upload their images to the site, um, and they could send them direct. I also built an Instagram, so people could hashtag the images, and then we then had to contact them to get high-res images. So it was quite a laborious process of collecting. Um, I had a great research team um, that I was working with, a small but very good team, and we did um, a series of events. Um, this is from one we did at uh, Ace Hotel. We also did um, events at the Tate, uh, the v &A, uh, a boutique called Strut. So what people could do, um, they could actually bring in their images for archiving. So I wasn't interested in getting images that were, on, that, that were flying around the internet. I was interested in getting people's original source material. Um, and that was, this was great because it really enabled people who might not have access to the internet, older people who might could bring in their stuff to be digitized and scanned. And it was really, really exciting to just be constantly gathering this stuff in. Um, we also did partnerships with Days um, for their Music Nation series, where we created a series of images, which was really great because it really helped to publicize the project and get, again, get more contributions in. And we also used um, lots of kind of, I guess, internet revival sites, lots of Facebook groups and communi community groups, which the internet has spawned thousands of, um, to help us source images um, for this project. This is one from a, a skate park in Kettering, which look, kind of looks like Miami or something. Um, so it's great to be able to have access to these groups. Um, there's, there's none of this in the book because this is American, but I just wanted to show you this um, fantastic in Instagram, uh, Veterinas and Rukas. So this was a kind of set, set up by Guadalare, Guadalupe Rosales. She sort of morphed her Instagram into a massive crowdsourced archive of LA, Chicano gang and party scene in the 1990s. So I guess the purpose of this is really, really about her connecting with friends and her network. So from collecting to editing. Unlike the sites I've just mentioned, my primary aim was not about connecting to reconnect with old friends. It was about observing and revealing social patterns. Um, how can I present what I've collected with meaning, and how can I do this with the book format? It's a little bit about how I kind of edited and selected for the book. And the first um, important thing was I decided that I wanted the book to focus on British youth culture. Um, the publishers had said to me that if I did British and American, I could do a much wider print run and probably make a bit more money than the huge money in book publishing. Um, so this was um, the first kind of limit that I set. I think it probably ties into this idea of sort of romantic notions of Britishness that appealed to me, but also how things are changing uh, in our kind of internet age and whether this will still be relevant in 50 years' time because global cultures are, are so different now. Um, I wanted the book to be... Um, I didn't want the book to be chronological. I didn't want it to be like a top-down history. So I decided to um, split the book up into chapters, um, uh, kind of according to social spaces. So the chapters were home, on the street, shopping for an identity, away days, and we dance the dance. So this is an image from the home chapter. It's one of my favourites. And it's um, Paul Dyson, and it's him in his kitchen. And I just really like, I just really like the details, the little, the little plaits, and the fact that you've kind of got the social backdrop and the story that came with this. It was also really great to be able to pair images together, and this is like the most fun part of the creative process for me. So here you've got 1984 in Leicester and 1994 in London. And that was kind of, that's the, for me, the fun of collecting is the sorting and, and just looking at those kind of social parallels. I was led quite visually um, by the book. There was lots of amazing and interesting text. It was really important for me that the text was, accompanied the images and gave them context. But um, I had to prioritize the images in the edit. So obviously, as you can see, this is one of Flair's. Um, this is an interesting one from the On the Street chapter. It's a submission from um, Riaz Khan, who was a self-proclaimed Asian casual. So I think the casual movement is generally thought of as quite a racist movement. So what I quite like about this image is it tells a different story. Um, and it, I kind of... We actually did have a lot of text with this image, and he kind of gave a whole backdrop to his story. But it kind of is, there's a potential to put, some, put something into history to change the story that we usually hear and to potentially break down myths and stereotypes. Um, there's a few more photo booth images. Um, everyone seemed to have taken their photo with Woolworths, which is quite interesting because it's now completely defunct, and so is probably the photo booth image. 
This is an image from the away days chapter um, from a kind of a club night called Dirt Box, and this is them on an away day. And I just chucked this one in last minute because I just thought this just image of the smokers might not be something we see so much in 50 years' time. This is a really great image. I love their style. This is from um, a club called JJ's in Clapham, which was um, in the late 70s. And a photographer called Peter Williams, well, he wasn't a photographer, he was very much just an attendee of the club. And what he'd do is every, every week he'd go out and sh he'd shoot everyone in the club and he'd take the photos and he'd print them out and he'd put them up on the walls and people could can buy the images after that. So I think we've traced him through a Facebook group, a kind of um, revival Facebook group, and he had an amazing collection of images. So just to kind of, it was like coming across a treasure trove of, of amazing stuff. And there's just so much energy in these photos and a real sense of, it almost takes you back in time and you get that, that feeling of being there. This is um, a series of ID cards from the We Dance the Dance chapter. Um, just an important point to make is I've kind of collected and collected all the stuff, but these are just images of the ID, ID cards. It's not a physical collection. I don't own any of the images. I only had rights to release them for the book. So my role wasn't really like to collect and possess. It was to bring these images, um, unseen images, um, together for everyone to see. So what I'd now like to do, aside from another book, is to work in partnership with an educational institution or a museum to turn the archive into a public resource. Um, yeah, so this, this is actually one tangible thing I do have. This is an envelope which contained a letter from someone that wrote to me when I was a teenager. Um, I think it kind of speaks volumes really about the book's popularity. I think it, the reason why it sold really well is it kind of came at a turning point for how we record our lives and how young people record their day to day today. I think thousands of images are taken and shared daily, um, just beyond compared to how it was 10, 20 years ago. But what if the internet was to disappear? I think the images that would remain and are preserved were the ones that would become history and tell the story of the past for years to come. And for me, this is why collecting can be a really powerful, important tool. So hopefully this archiving project puts forward a broader and more authentic selection of people's stories into visual history. That's it.